Okay, this is part one of today's lecture. We now begin the last series of topics here in the AP curriculum prior to the AP exam itself. We begin now with Faraday's Law here in chapter 29. Faraday's Law is the fourth of Maxwell's equations. And as you'll see, it's also kind of tricky to visualize exactly what is happening in my demonstrations of Faraday's Law. So before I go any further, immediately go ahead and pause this film right here, and then take a look at the two demonstration videos that I've posted for you of Faraday's Law in today's folder. Okay, now that you've seen those demonstration videos, let me take you through exactly what it was that you were seeing in the first of those two. Okay, so chapter 29, Faraday's Law. Okay, as I stated in the demonstration video, we can introduce Faraday's Law in the following way. Jump back for a moment to Ampere's Law. When Ampere's Law recalled that basically a moving electrical charge creates a magnetic field. Does it work the other way around? That is, does a magnetic field then cause a force to be exerted upon a charged particle, causing the charged particle to move? As you saw in the demonstration video, the answer to that question is no. However, if I do take the bar magnet and I moved it, for example, close to the solenoid, you then saw an alternating current was generated. So basically, I summarized that portion of the lecture thus far with that demonstration by basically saying a moving magnetic field causes a current to be generated. That's kind of a simplistic way, however, of describing Faraday's law. Here's a more complete description of what you saw in that demonstration. Okay, so let's say it right here is my solenoid like so, just a single coil of wire, and then I also have my bar magnet. So let's say it right here is my bar magnet. Here's the north pole, and then here's the south pole. And now I'm gonna draw a couple of field lines, magnetic field lines from the bar magnet passing through the coil of wire. Like so. And now with this diagram, you have to think three-dimensionally. So right here in blue is the coil of wire like so, passing in front of the red magnetic field lines associated with the bar magnet, the magnetic field lines here, we'll just label as B. Okay, notice that three of the magnetic field lines that I have drawn here, they intersect the plane of the coil of wire. Here, here, and here. Specifically through the coil of wire, there is a magnetic flux. Okay, and then let's say that I exert a force on the bar magnet in this direction. So the bar magnet now moves in this direction like so. Watch what happens to the field lines here as they pass through the coil of wire. There's going to be a change in the magnetic flux. That then looks like this. Okay, so once again, Right here is my loop of wire, and now I'm gonna go ahead and place the bar magnet here a lot closer to the coil of wire than what I had originally. Here's the north and south pole like so. And then I've got the same five magnetic field lines in red. But now in this case, I'm gonna draw it such that all those field lines intersect the plane of the loop of wire, that is like so. like this. Once again, you have to think three-dimensionally here on this diagram. So I'm going to go ahead and here in blue draw the loop of wire in front of these field lines like so. Make that a little bit neater. Like so. Okay, and then the field lines themselves, they intersect here, 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 and here, like so, in the plane of the loop of wire itself. Notice that the amount of magnetic flux that is passing through the loop of wire is greater than where it was originally. When there is a changing magnetic flux, this then induces a current in the loop of wire.
Okay, which way does the current flow? This is where it gets a little tricky. The, alter, the current must flow in a direction such that it always opposes the change in the magnetic flux. Here's the easiest way of thinking about it. Think about it merely in terms of Newton's third law. Let's say that we consider the bar magnet to be pushing against the coil of wire. So then therefore the coil of wire has to push back. This then means that a current must flow within the wire that looks like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw the current that's induced like so here within the wire. Now, why does the current have to flow like that? Well, look at the direction of my thumb here using right hand rule. Notice that my thumb is pointing down. This is the direction of the magnetic field associated now with this loop of wire. This is why the Biot Savart law calculation at the end of chapter 28 is so important because as the current flows like so, it then creates its own magnetic field that points downwards on the diagram. Now I'm gonna to have to use another color here on my diagram to illustrate that. But right here in black, like so, that right there is the induced magnetic field associated with this induced current. So then therefore, because that black magnetic field points downwards on my diagram, below the loop of wire, it behaves like a north magnetic pole. Above the loop of wire, it behaves like a south magnetic pole. In other words, we have a north magnetic pole associated with this bar magnet, now pushing against another magnet, pushing against the north magnetic pole that's induced here, below the loop of wire. If you instead had the current flow in this direction, this would then mean that below the loop of wire you would have a south magnetic pole. That south magnetic pole would exert a force of attraction on this north magnetic pole. In other words, it would be as if I was pushing the bar magnet in this direction through the loop of wire and then all of a sudden the loop of wire pulls me in that direction like so. That can't happen. That would violate conservation of energy. Where would the energy necessary for all that to occur come from? It would have come out of nowhere. So then therefore, basically what I'm doing here, and this is how I tend to think of it, this is how I keep it straight in my head, is that I'm pushing against the coil of wire, and then therefore the coil of wire has to push back. Watch what happens if we now take the bar magnet and I pull it out of the loop of wire, like so. Okay, I have basically have to redraw this from scratch. All right, so once again, here's my loop of wire like so. Let's say that right here is the north and south poles of my bar magnet. And let me clean this up a little bit. <laughs> make my magnet a little smaller. Let me make my wire here a little larger to illustrate. Okay, and then I have in red the magnetic field lines associated with the bar magnet. Like so. Once again, you have to think three-dimensionally on this diagram. So the wire here passes in front of those red magnetic field lines. Okay, so the magnetic field associated with the bar magnet looks like that, and then intersects the plane of the loop of wire right here. And now I'll exert a force on the bar magnet in this direction like so. So I pull the bar magnet out of the coil of wire. Okay, watch what happens to the magnetic flux here through the coil of wire, the plane of the coil of wire itself. So here's the wire once again. Okay, let me go ahead and put the bar magnet way down here. Here's the north and south poles like so. And then I've got my five magnetic field lines. So, once again, think three-dimensionally here on the diagram. 
here in blue, this passes in front of the field lines. One, two, three. Notice that there is a decrease in this case of the magnetic flux through the coil of wire from the top diagram to the one down here below. Now, the induced current that flows has to oppose the changing magnetic flux. So then therefore, in this case, this then means that the induced current has to flow like this through the wire. Like so. So here's the induced current I. Okay, now why does it have to flow that way? Well, as the current flows like this through the wire, through beyond Savart once again, end of chapter 28, it creates its own magnetic field in this direction. So right here is the induced magnetic field. Once again in black. This then means that above the coil of wire, it behaves like a north magnetic pole. Down below the coil of wire, it behaves like a south magnetic pole. So then therefore, when I take the bar magnet and I move it down in this direction, here's how I think of it, I pull against the wire. Therefore, the wire has to pull back. So then therefore, if I pull the magnet in this direction, I pull the north pole out, a south pole then pulls back on me in this manner. Once again, this is essentially a representation of Newton's third law. It's actually a portion of Faraday's law that is referred to as Lenz's law. It describes the direction of the induced current within the wire. So the induced current has to flow like this to give me a south magnetic pole down below the wire, which then pulls back on me as I pull the bar magnet out. So this is why you saw in the first of my demonstrations, the current flow in one direction when I push the north pole in, and then the current flowed in the opposite direction when I pulled the north pole out. The same thing is basically happening in that little hanger demonstration as well, Faraday's Law Demonstration 2. If you haven't seen that video, go ahead and pause here and take a look at that video. What I'm basically doing in that video is I'm taking my bar magnet and I'm pushing the pole in, so I push against the hanger and then therefore the hanger rotates away from me. And then when I pull the pole out, then it's like I'm pulling against the hanger and then the hanger rotates towards me. Once again, the direction of the induced current flows to oppose the changing magnetic flux. Okay, basically the reverse of these two situations here occur when I take the south pole, for example, of my bar magnet and first push it in and then secondly pull it out. Here's a basic description of that. Okay, so once again, here's my coil of wire. Okay, uh, let's, I'm gonna be pushing the magnet in. So let me draw it down here first. Here's the south pole. Here's the north, the north pole. I'm gonna push it in this direction like so. Let me go ahead and draw some field lines here. Okay, because this is a south magnetic pole, my red magnetic field associated with the bar magnet, it points like that. Once again, we have to think three-dimensionally here on this diagram, like so. Okay, and then right here, the field lines then intersect the plane of the loop of wire. There is right here a magnetic flux. Now, I'll change the magnetic flux by pushing the bar magnet in this direction. When I do, these field lines will then pass through the plane of the coil of wire. Okay, so south and north once again, and now I'll take all five of my field lines here and pass them through the plane of the loop. Like so. Here's the direction associated with those field lines. Thinking three-dimensionally on the diagram once again. And then right here is a new description of the magnetic flux. So I'm changing the magnetic flux through the plane of the coil of wire from the top diagram to the bottom diagram. The induced current flows such that it always opposes the changing magnetic flux. Once again, just think of it in terms of Newton's third law. If I push against the coil of wire, the coil of wire has to push 
back. So then therefore, if I have a south pole here, the induced current will have to flow such that I end up with a south pole here down below the loop of wire. From right-hand rule, this then means that the induced current has to flow like this. Like so. And then from beyond Savart, it creates its own magnetic field, which points upwards on the diagram. Once again, in black here, like so. This is the induced field. And then therefore, above the loop, this behaves like a north magnetic pole. Below the loop, it behaves like a south magnetic pole. So if I push the south pole of the magnet in, then the induced current flows such that it pushes back on me with a south pole here down below. Compare this diagram of pushing the south pole in to the first diagram that I drew a while ago that described what happened when I pushed the north pole in. You'll see that the direction of the induced current has changed from the first diagram to this one here. Okay, and then lastly, just to finish this off, let's just go ahead now and pull the bar magnet out. So this is the last of these basic descriptions here. Okay, now what I'll do is I'll take the south pole of my bar magnet and I'll pull it out in this direction like so. Okay, so initially I've got all five of my field lines here that I've been drawing passing through the coil of wire. Once again, here's the direction associated with those field lines. Thinking three-dimensionally here on the diagram. Like so. Here are the field lines passing through the plane of the loop. Okay, now we pull the south pole out. So I'll then have my second diagram with these field lines here then missing the loop. Okay, so once again, here's my coil. Here's my bar magnet with south and north poles now way down here. And now I've got my five red field lines. Like so. There's the direction associated with them. Think three-dimensionally here on the diagram once again. And now from the top diagram to the bottom diagram, I once again have a changing magnetic flux passing through the coil of wire. The induced current flows to oppose that changing magnetic flux. So then therefore, if I pull against the wire, that's basically what I'm doing here, the wire has to pull back. So then therefore, what type of magnetic pole needs to be induced down below the loop of wire? A north pole to pull against this south pole. This then means that the induced current has to flow like this. Like so. And then from beyond Savart, it gives us its own magnetic field downwards like this. So right there in black is once again the induced magnetic field. So then therefore, we have a north magnetic pole down here and a south magnetic pole right here. So this demonstration here, part one and also part two, my two demonstration videos, that summarizes for us in a very qualitative way exactly what is going on here with Faraday's law. How do you describe this mathematically? I'll get to that in just a few moments. Let me go ahead and stop this here as part one. I'll go ahead and get to part two in just a few minutes.